When Pastor Bitter and I start a new round of catechism students, uh, catechism classes, I usually try to find out what the uh, students that I'm about to teach sort of already understand and grasp. And so I'll ask the question, have them write out a, a little uh, test, basically. I'll ask the question, what, what is the main message of the Bible? Not what is a message of the Bible, because there's lots of different messages in the Scripture, but I'll ask them, what is the main message of the Bible? And they'll give a variety of different answers. Some will say that the main message of the Bible is to show us how to live. It's sort of like a guidebook for life. And the Bible certainly does have rules to follow and, and uh, advice on how to live and how life is going to work best, but that's not the main message of it. Some will say uh, the main message of the Bible is to help us recognize that if we sin, we'll go to hell. And uh, that's certainly a message in the Bible, but it's not the main message. Others will say, well, the main message is that God has demonstrated his love for sinners in Christ Jesus. And that's uh, getting a little bit closer to the main message of the Bible. We could probably say God summarizes the main message with three words. Main message of his scripture. Three words. <clears throat> Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Main message of the Bible. It's uh, what God said to Joseph when he found out that this woman to whom he made promises uh, to be faithful for the rest of his life, and she made promises to him to be faithful, he found out that she was with child, and he was 100% sure that it was not his. Which, you know, I mean, he had every right to be confused, frustrated, disappointed, to feel betrayed. But God sent an angel to him to say, Joseph, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. And, and then Matthew goes on to tell us that all those things took place to fulfill the word of the prophet. And just a little hint, anytime you see that in the New Testament where it says, this took place to fulfill something written long ago, it's always a good idea to, to go back and read the context around what, what that prophecy actually was. And it turns out that that prophecy came at a time that was similar to what Joseph was experiencing, which was turmoil and disappointment and um, fear, I guess. The, uh, there were two nations that were announcing their threat to destroy Jerusalem, and the people were terrified. They thought it was game over. These nations were much stronger than they were. But God came to the king at the time named Ahaz, and he said, don't be afraid. Trust in me. Be calm. It's just really interesting how God comes to people in the midst of, of complete terror and turmoil and hopelessness. And God just calmly says, don't be afraid. Trust in me. Why does that seem to be one of God's favorite things to say. The main message of the Bible. Sometimes we think when God tells us not to be afraid, we're just supposed to sort of dismiss some of the turmoil or conflict or trouble that's taking place in our life. We're supposed to kind of look past it, maybe pretend that it's not there. There's lots of people who are worse off than we are out there in the world. And so... Um, God's basically telling us, just, you know, get over it, okay? Don't just pretend like it's not that big of a deal. Give it to God, people will say. You, know, you ever heard somebody say, I just gave that to God. Well, you shouldn't have had it in the first place. Um, you and I are not that uh, powerful at all. So that's not good advice. That's like a, that's like a mechanic telling you uh, when there's rattling in your car to just turn your radio up. You know, turn your radio up and then you won't hear it and, and cross your fingers. Um, that's not what God does when he tells us don't be afraid. He's not saying ignore 
the, the things that you're experiencing inside of you and around you, get over it. That's, that's not it. He's, he's telling us, acknowledge that those things are real, just as real as Joseph's frustration would have been or as the people in Jerusalem were experiencing. That was real stuff. And we don't need to pretend like it's, it's not a big deal. But sometimes, too, we think that when God tells us not to be afraid, um, he's telling us to take a blind leap of faith. He wants, he wants us to do the thing that's really, really uncomfortable for us so that we learn how to conquer our fears, that God's trying to, he's trying to develop character inside of us and make us courageous people. And that'd be nice. I mean, that's, that's okay when that happens. But um, that would be like a dad who tells his kid to jump into the swimming pool because that's the only way you're going to learn how to swim, all right? And that child, all they can see is lots of water. And all that they know for sure is that they don't know how to swim. So telling us to take a blind leap of faith and conquer our fears, that's not what God's saying when he says don't be afraid. That's, that's not... That's not faith. That's foolishness to just jump off into the unknown. But the other side of that would be uh, to, to take God's word, don't be afraid, and interpret it as um, God wanting us to just live these quiet and peaceful lives where, you know, nobody's ever really going to bother us and we're not ever going to bother anybody else. And so this word, don't be afraid from God, sort of gets interpreted as, don't be too bold. Don't be too bold. It's really what Ahaz uh, did when, when God came to him. That king I was talking about earlier from Jerusalem, uh, he, he, God came to this king, Ahaz, and he said, Ahaz, listen, no, these nations are not going to harm you. I am going to show them that I am the Lord and no one touches my people when I say so. And Ahaz, if you want, if you're kind of wondering if I'm actually going to follow through on this, you ask me for a sign and I'll do it. Anything, Ahaz. I mean, it can be in the, the highest heights or the deepest. Ask me and I'll do it. And Ahaz said, oh, no. No, I would never put the Lord to the test. I, who am I that I would ask God for a sign? And I guess we would say that it's kind of like false humility. Um, making it look or sound like we're so humble that we would never expect God to do great things. And that's not faith. That's, that's fear. And Paul says that whatever is not of faith is sin. It's, it's evil. Don't be afraid. That's God's, seems to be God's favorite thing to say and the, the main message really of the Bible. But why is it that God, that God loves to say that? To answer that question, we need to, to think about signs. And um, God has always desired to dwell among the people that he has created. Even, even after we rebelled against him, who had given us everything and um, who, who put Adam and Eve in a perfect garden home in God's presence, gave them everything they needed, they rebelled and God said, I'm, I still long to dwell among my people. And so he would give them signs that he was with them. Adam and Eve heard God as he was walking through the garden. Or when God was delivering the, uh, the uh, Israelites, taking them through the barren wilderness, he gave them signs that he was with them. Uh, a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of, of fire by night. And then uh, even after the Israelites eventually built this temple for the, as a dwelling place for the Lord, he came down in a glory cloud, a sign that he was with them to bless them and to save them. And even though Ahaz said, you know what, I would, I'd never ask God for a sign, God said, well, I'm going to give you one anyways. <laughs> I'm going to give you one anyways. The virgin will conceive, and she will give birth to a son, and you will give him the name Emmanuel, which means God has come to live with us. 
When all that we can see around us and inside of us is weakness, trouble, turmoil, conflict, shame, and death, God gives us a sign that he is with us, and it's a little boy born of a virgin. Which sounds like about the, mo- the least helpful thing <laughs> God could possibly do. Unless, of course, she really was a virgin, and that child really is God himself. When Jesus came to live with us, God in the flesh, he, uh, he actually came to take trouble and conflict and disappointment and shame and let it consume him, let it swallow him up. There was a section in uh, the gospel according to John chapter 12. Jesus was, he had just raised Lazarus from the dead. Maybe you remember that account. His friend Lazarus called him out of the tomb to life again and and then some people, some non-Jewish people wanted to see Jesus, and so he, he started to realize the cross is not far away, and this is what he said. Now my heart is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it's for this very reason that I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. And God did glorify his name. And he he glorifies his name by saving weak, desperate, helpless, guilty people. And Jesus fearlessly conquered everything that you and I fear, the the righteous wrath of God. He, He conquered death and the powers of darkness, and he did it on a cross. Um, There's a hymn that says, uh, by weakness and defeat, he won the glorious crown, trod all his foes beneath his feet by being trodden down. And then three days later, after Jesus' body was buried in a tomb, some women went to look for it, and it wasn't there. But just as a messenger appeared to Joseph decades earlier, so a, a, a messenger appeared to those women. And do you know what his message was? Don't be afraid. I know you're looking for Jesus who was crucified, but he's not here. He's risen, just as he said. So friends, don't be afraid. I know everybody here has stuff going on, all right? I know we all come here and say I'm doing okay, and we smile at each other and nod our heads. I know everybody here has something going on, maybe in a relationship or uh, with children who are going through hard things or struggles in your faith life, whatever it is, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. For God has come to live with us. God has come to die instead of us. And Jesus Christ, our Lord, has been raised from the dead. Don't be afraid. Joseph, um, he really, (sighs) he had a lot to deal with after he found out this news that um, Mary had a child in in her belly. That meant, though, that he had a bride to love and to take care of, and he had a little child to raise, and uh, this was really going to turn their world upside down. But because God was with them, Joseph loved Mary as though she was his, his own body, and Mary loved and followed Joseph as though he was her head, um, the two had become one flesh. Really, that's what marriage is about. It's uh, actually 
a sign of something much greater than just a man and a woman promising to spend the rest of their lives together. Marriage is a sign of, of something else. Um, really, it's, it's a sign of God's presence still uh, among people here on earth. Do you know what is the sign of God's presence still in the world today? It's the church, which is the body of Christ. And the church isn't a building. The church isn't something we go to on Sunday morning. The church is what we are. The beloved bride of Jesus, which he cleansed through the washing with water and the word to present us to himself as a radiant bride without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish. And that means that we don't, we're not living to get clean. It means that we're living from God's declaration that we already are clean through faith in his son. And we are Christ's body. And as the Apostle Paul says, no one ever hated his his own body or, or didn't take care of it, but they feed it and they do things to take care of their body just as Christ does the church, who comes to feed us and to take care of us this morning through the meal where he gives us his body that was broken and his blood that was shed for us. And uh, God glorifies his name through you and me, through his body, um, by showing to the world that these are people he's saved, that he has rescued from darkness and from despair, and, uh, and then by, by sending us out into the world to be a blessing to other people and to bring his promises to other people. Um, and, and God is really doing that through you and me and through our lives. So may he be glorified in us and through us. Uh, and, and just, you know, fear not, Isaiah says. God says through Isaiah, really, fear not, for I've redeemed you, and I've called you by name, you're mine. Amen.